An American arrested in Russia and charged with espionage. Sound familiar? Too familiar for the family of Paul Whelan. The EPA hits the accelerator on electric vehicles. Is it at all realistic? And the summer travel season approaches in Pure Michigan. Today is Sunday, April 16, 2023, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. So glad to have you with us. We have a very busy morning ahead. A lot of things I've wanted to get to. Up first, we're going to be talking with David Whelan. He's the twin brother of Novi's Paul Whelan, who has been in a Russian prison for more than four years now. He's watched other Americans released and sent home, like basketball star Brittany Griner. And now another American has been arrested. And the similarities to Paul's case are striking. Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich is, like Paul, accused of espionage. Like Paul, he too was denied consular access. With the U.S. and Russia at such profound odds over the Russian war in Ukraine, is there any hope of finding a diplomatic solution? We'll talk with Paul's brother David in just a moment. We're also going to talk about the new push from the Biden administration this past week to speed up our move to electric vehicles. The EPA is proposing much stiffer emissions requirements that would mean electrics would make up to two-thirds of all American vehicle sales in just nine years. Is that even remotely realistic? We'll talk about that, too. And this past week, the governor convened a pure Michigan travel and tourism conference in Grand Rapids. We'll talk about the health of that industry on our pleasant peninsulas all today on Flashpoint. I am disappointed to have my first guest on the program today because it means that his brother Paul Whelan is still being held in a Russian prison. A couple of new developments put Paul's plight in new relief. Let's talk about it with Paul's brother David Whelan, who is again uh, with me on Flashpoint. David, I really appreciate your time again. I want to start with the arrest of Evan Gershkovich, the Wall Street Journal reporter charged with espionage that I know sounds very familiar to you. What was your immediate thought when you heard about the arrest? Oh, my heart sank uh, because I could immediately imagine what he was going through uh, based on what Paul had experienced and then also what his family is going through uh, because our family, you know, has been down that path. And, and really the last few weeks have been almost like reliving what happened to Paul because people are asking, well, how did it happen in Paul's case? So you're going back and, and reliving each of those events, each of those hearings that came along. And this arrest reportedly, we've learned, has come with the specific approval from Vladimir Putin. Does that... Uh, change or tell you anything about the calculus on this? It doesn't. I think Paul's case and uh, Mr. Gershkovich's case are both uh, trumped up by the state security services, almost for sure. Uh, that would have been floated to the very top, either to uh, Bortnikov, who's in charge of the FSB, or at least uh, to President Putin. So uh, no, no surprise. I mean, again, it's just blackmail. And uh, unfortunately, the U.S. has to decide if it can come up with concessions to bring these Americans home. All of these Russian names and departments that you can't believe that you now know, I'm sure, is this true. Um, the other thing, uh, last week we had this release of classified material, and so much of it was devoted to U.S. intelligence and aid to Ukraine. I, 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 I didn't imagine that that helped at all. What are your thoughts on that part of this? Yeah, it's been interesting to watch. The, uh, the Russian government, I think, was, uh, it has been leery uh, based on what's been reported in the Russian media. Uh, I think in, in a way it might be useful, depending on whether it's true or not, if the U.S. has actually been able to uh, exploit Russian state security services and, and intelligence services that mm. uh, they may be trying something new that we don't know about. Yeah, interesting. Uh, you, of course, you and your family went several weeks without hearing from Paul, and I know those are always uh, worrisome gaps for you. Uh, then you got to talk to him, and I know you spoke to him just again here on Thursday, but you, you've said this past week that he now is really fearful of just being left behind. Yeah, uh, you know, it's almost a psychological thing. His, uh, his health is stabilized as far as, you know, he's, what he's eating and his weight, and, you know, he's, he's doing the best he can there, but it's really psychological. How long can you go uh, and and continue to survive mentally in that sort of a situation. And I think now that he has been left behind twice uh, by the U.S. government, uh, he's worried about it happening a third time and, and really having to face whether he can continue to survive past that. You, you say left behind twice. We had we had Trevor Reed, uh, who uh, was released. We had Brittany Griner, who, of course, was quite uh, famously released. Why do you think that Paul is being treated so differently. Uh, does it tell us something about how Russia feels about the charge? I think so. Uh, I th certainly, that was our um, understanding last year. Uh, Trevor Reed and Brittany Griner's cases both involved very 
uh, important charges, but not as serious as espionage from the Russian perspective. And and so we'll really see now. Mr. Gershkovich has been charged with the same uh, crime and will probably go through the same process and make him out with the same sort of sentence. And so I think uh, it will be interesting to see how the Russians treat that case. Yeah, sure will. Uh, your sister Elizabeth took to Facebook this past Thursday, and she said that Paul deserves better. And the suggestion was aimed very directly at the White House. I, I'm wondering about your and the family's level of frustration, not with the Russians, but with the White House and the effort that's being put toward Paul's release. The, the level of frustration is very high right now. Uh, I mean, obviously, we are communicating with Paul and we experience what he's experiencing and we are trying to represent uh, his position and advocate for him. And uh, all we're getting right now is words from the, the White House, from the State Department. Uh, they talk about a significant proposal, but they've been talking about that for four months and there's been no action. Uh, we've seen resources that were used for uh, um, bringing home uh, Americans from Russia uh, and, and that bypassed Paul for reasons that you know, aren't really clear to us. Uh, and, and now we see that the U.S. has not been successful at deterring Russia from taking another American. Yeah. And so it makes us wonder exactly what they're going to be doing to bring Paul home. Well, and you and I've talked before, when, when Paul was originally arrested, uh, Russia was not invading Ukraine. And now that war continues, uh, now gone past a year with no sign of end, ending anytime soon. And everyone in the world knows that the U.S. and Ukraine are allies on this. That really complicates this, doesn't it? I think it could. Uh, I mean, on, on the one hand, you have Ukraine and Russia exchanging prisoners. So even people who are at war can come up to some agreement and make concessions to each other if they can find uh, uh, even ground to talk on. So I think that the U.S. could be doing this. Uh, it's not really clear to me why the U.S. has struggled so much to come up with concessions that the U.S. or the uh, Kremlin wants in exchange to return Americans. Well, are you privy, actually, to, to, do you feel like you're privy to the specifics of the conversations between the U.S. and Russia on getting him home? I, I mean, for instance, do they, do they still insist that he's guilty of spying, or has this become more about what each side can be trading for? I think it's really just about what they can trade for. The Russians insist that he is a spy in the same way that they're insisting that Mr. Gershkovich is a spy. That's all false. I mean, there's there's no evidence. There will never be any evidence to support those charges. So it really is a matter of them staking out a position and having Americans that they want to use for trade uh, for whatever kind of trade, whether it's sanctions relief or whether it's for prisoners or whatever that's what they're looking for. And unfortunately, so far, the U.S. hasn't been able to figure out what that is. And and so they uh, they're in a position where they have resources uh, and either aren't using them smartly or uh, are, are misusing them. And, and I think that that's our concern right now is that Paul is, you know, once again, part of a substantial proposal to the Kremlin to have him released. But now there's another American and, and maybe those resources get diverted a third time. Would you say that where, where's your level of over the we've talked so many times now here, where's your level of optimism now? Pretty bleak or about the same as it's been? On a scale of one to ten, probably close to one, pretty low at this yeah. point. I, I mean, I, you know, I think it, we're, we may be getting to the point where we have to just say to our parents, it's 12 more years, please hang on, because, uh, you know, there isn't an obvious creative strategy that the U.S. government has to bring Paul home in the short term. Yeah, that would be the original sentence of sentenced to 16 years in prison in Russia. Uh, David, I so appreciate the update, and I really hope that the next time we talk, we have more happier things to talk about. Thanks so much for being here. You too. Thanks for having me. You bet. We'll continue with more. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. If you have been skeptical about the pace at which uh, the American auto industry has been trying to push toward an electrification future, uh, then you were probably doubly perplexed this past week as the EPA announced that they were going to step on the accelerator even harder to push you toward EVs. Very happy to have with me Paul Eisenstein, the longtime auto writer and the head of the Detroit Bureau. Uh, Paul, anybody who watches this program knows that I'm a believer in, in EVs, but I believe them in, in you know for me, uh, and I believe them for individuals. My life is set up for it. I live about 10 miles from work. I don't know yet that the masses, that their lives are set up for EVs. Is this too much too soon? Well, it's a 10-year period, or nearly 10 years, that the Biden administration is laying out. So uh, that that seems like an acceptable uh, challenge to, to put out there. But there are a lot of things that are going to have to fall in place for this. And by the way, I'm also an EV owner. Yep. I have a 
Ford F-150 Lightning. So I understand the challenges that go with it. Uh, an EV isn't for everybody, but neither is a Corvette nor a <laughs> diesel pickup, right? Uh, there are lots of different options, but we're going to see a lot of those phase out. And the challenge will be to pull all the pieces together. The good news is Americans are increasingly getting comfortable with EVs. It's gone from less than 1% of new car sales in 2019 to about 5 plus percent at the end of 2022. And according to J.D. Power, it was up to 8.5% in February. Um, a lot of uh, uh, those who would prefer to let the market make these decisions uh, are skeptical of sort of government overreach here. Do they have a point on that? Uh, rather than pushing the market, why don't we let the market decide? Well, we could also pull the government out of supporting uh, the oil industry. <laughs> we, we spend tens of billions of dollars supporting them, and I'm not even including all the spending that we put in on the military to ensure that we have a good pipeline for the Middle East. Uh, so, so the reality is, uh, yeah, we, we conceivably could call this government intervention, uh, but the, the government intervenes in a lot of things, the highways, uh, the planning, where, where do we have freeways and yeah. so on and so yeah. forth. Yeah. Uh, so I, I find that a little disingenuous. Uh, the reality is the market is moving there and without some government intervention. It will take a lot longer and we'll have a lot more problem dealing with the climate issue. Well, there's also a concern when it comes to national security over the fact that um, by giving up where we are and the way that we have come to know the auto industry, we're playing into the hands of China, which has been uh, much quicker to adapt to uh, EVs. Uh, they almost by necessity, their cities certainly uh, can't handle some of their most many of their cities can't handle too many more emissions problems. Uh, but that we're, they also control a lot of the battery market, a lot of the rare earth metals uh, market that we're really sort of playing into Chinese hands, and that right now looks like a geopolitical problem. Well, uh, Devin, you and I both have been covering the auto industry for many, many years. And how long has it been that you have been reporting about the geopolitical uncertainties connected with the uh, security <laughs> of our oil pipeline from the Middle East, right? It's fair. Uh, there's, all sorts of, there's all sorts of uncertainties, no matter where we get our energy and what we use, what we use the energy to propel us in. Uh, so, yes, there is no question we have to find a way to minimize our dependence on China. And that's not just on automobiles, but on semiconductors, iPhone manufacturing. And gosh, how many plastic things did you get last year from, sure. from uh, Amazon or Walmart that come from China? Uh, so this isn't new. Uh, the good news is the infrastructure bill and particularly the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, put in some very strict language that is resulting in a huge burst of manufacturing here in North America, particularly the U.S., of key components. Vehicles are being assembled here. More will come in. Battery production will have to move to the United States. And the rare earths that we now depend on China and Russia for will increasingly come from U.S., Canada, Mexico. Just to give you one example, the number of battery plants that have been announced in the U.S. or Canada, mostly in the U.S., since the IRA was passed last August, is now almost 20. And that's enough to build somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 million, maybe mm. 10 million battery electric vehicles. Yeah. Um, one of the other big problems, though, that remains that uh, I, I know vexes all of the automakers. What are we going to do with all these batteries eventually when they uh, have, have outlived their usefulness as a vehicle battery? I suppose there's, uh, there may be ways to uh, repurpose them for other uses, whatever charge they can hold. But have you heard a great answer yet for what we do with all of these lithium batteries? Yeah, the answer is recycling and reuse. Uh, there are two things that, that I believe the industry is going to do. Number one, we're going to see a small percentage of them uh, go into second life operation. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. We live in, in the greater Detroit area where, guess what? We have a lot of problems with power. We see a lot of outages here. Well, a lot of people are talking about using second life batteries. That could be at a, uh, to keep the GM, power, uh, GM assembly plant, uh, the Detroit Hamtramck plant, running in case of a blackout or just keeping energy to our homes during a winter blackout like we had yep. in many cases during the ice storms. Yep. 
But recycling is going to be the critical thing. I was very pleased to see that when Ford announced Blue Oval City down near Memphis, that one of the things they put in there was a battery plant. Another thing they put in there was a battery recycling, recycling plant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Last thing I wanted to make sure we got to, uh, Paul, it seems to me where there's less talk now about range anxiety uh, and more talk about charger anxiety. Where they are, do we have enough, and how long it takes to charge? Yeah, that's absolutely the case. Uh, yeah, people are still worried. I mean, we lose range, especially here in Michigan in cold, cold weather. So. Uh, it's nice to get more range than less. And I do believe that we're going to see most vehicles go to a minimum 300 miles in the future, at least with the long range pack, packs that they're offering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the charging anxiety is going to be more of an issue. We're going to have to see millions of new chargers go around the United States and even in neighboring countries like Canada. Here's a good thing. Most of the time, people are going to charge at home. So the reality is, unless you're taking a long trip, every single day you're going to come out to your EV, and it's going to be full if you plugged it in. How often can you say that about your gas vehicle? That's fair. Yep, that's fair. Absolutely right. Uh, we will save uh, the grid's fitness for handling all that charging for another conversation, Paul. <laughs> it's always good to catch up with you. Really appreciate the time. Great to be with you. You bet. We come back. We'll talk about Pure Michigan. This is Flashpoint on Local Four. Was same. Well, vacation season, of course, is just about on us. We're getting past the spring break season. The governor held a tourism and travel conference in Grand Rapids this past week. What is the state of our pure Michigan efforts now that the world is again fully open to travel? Very happy to have with me, coming from the great outdoors in Michigan, Dave Lorenz, the vice president of Travel Michigan. Dave, really appreciate the time. Got a beautiful spot there for this uh, to frame our conversation. Tell me a little bit about your uh, sense about whether the world is back up and running yet when it comes to travel. We know planes are full, that's for sure. Yeah, that is absolutely for sure. They're full for the wrong reason, though. We can get to that in just a second. The good news is people are ready to travel again, and they're in the spirit and mood to travel. And luckily, here in Pure Michigan, we have such a diverse state of people, places, experiences, and even seasons that we have everything that people are looking for, unless they're looking for saltwater and sharks. We have it all, <laughs> and believe me, I think they're gonna travel this year more than ever. We're gonna do our part to make sure they do. The The new Pure Michigan uh, Keep It Fresh campaign is out there. You're gonna see a little different presentation in the Pure Michigan branding. A little more vibrant music, uh, a little more uh, kind of fun and, and action-based uh, videography and the TV ads. You're gonna hear two voices, by the way, in addition to Tim Allen, you'll hear Jessica Kerr Moore from Detroit, uh, a performance uh, actress, uh, mm -hmm. voice actress, and uh, poet. And we're really excited that all this is coming together in a way that we can really showcase the great diversity in the state. It's our it's our greatest value. Well, you hit on something that I I, I wanted to dig into, and that is uh, the, the, the fresh idea. And, and we've, we've talked a lot about uh, whether Michigan can end up having uh, a being a beneficiary of the climate problems elsewhere. I imagine that that we talked about that with residency, but that's got to happen with travel too, right? It does. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, as we head into the warm weather season, we're reminded that we're a four season state. And yep. I think a lot of people in the past always thought that that really great place for them to be forever would be down south. And now they see that it's getting so darn hot uh, as we go through these these weather changes, uh, that we are gonna see more and more people considering the Midwest and the Great Lakes area, at least for four seasons out of the year. And I hope we can change people's opinions about winter as well, because <laughs> it really is an issue of getting out there and being part of any season that makes it worthwhile. That's, in fact, I was wonder, a marvel about the folks in the UP. That's exactly what they do. They, they embrace winter rather than run from it. I'm really, how, how old is the uh, Pure Michigan campaign now? I don't even know. Yeah, Pure Michigan's been around for 17 years, wow. uh, considered the best branding campaigns in the world, and we take great pride in knowing that, but it's also a great responsibility, and we feel that as Michigan has always been the innovator state, we need to be innovative in the way we present our state and our brand and, and use the brand to encourage people to go to places where people 
appear to be different than them. And I'll tell you, we may be a state that's very diverse racially, religiously, age-wise, yeah. financial status, ability level. But we're all the same in the most essential, important ways. We all want a better life for our kids and grandkids. So the more we travel and get to know each other, the better. And I think as we get that message across, we're going to lead this country back to coming together and back to understanding that we're in this together. Uh, and I, I'm really looking forward to being part of that, that social mission as we also are part of the economic story of getting our economy back uh, the, as well. The social part of it is one of the great, great things uh, for those of us who love to travel. Um, I, 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 I can't really think of too many campaigns that have been more successful than Pure Michigan. We all use it, we all say it all the time, we use it in our hashtags. Uh, my wife and I were at one of the Great Lakes last week and, and watching the sun come up. I even said, well, look at that, it's pure Michigan. But I, I know yeah. how strong it is with us. How, what's your sense of how strong that brand has been among people who don't live here? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, that 2020 year when COVID first hit, we were out of funding. We had no funding that year because of a issue between the administration and, and the legislature. Yeah. And typically when a brand doesn't market especially for an entire year. And then on top of that, all the impact of COVID and, and such, typically what happens is you're forgotten and it takes a long time to build, uh, build back your steam. But the great thing is this brand is so strong and we've had such a great history that in 2022, we beat the record number of 2019 when it came to both travel volume and travel spending. The challenge though, is that it's still an uneven recovery. We need to get people back to the cities back to places like the Detroit area. It's so important. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Uh, the, uh, as, we're as I'm talking to you from downtown Detroit, for many, many years, Detroit was not exactly uh, a place that we tried to sell for people to come. That's very changed dramatically. How big of a piece of the entire Michigan landscape is Detroit travel now? It's huge. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you think about it, you know, about 40% of our population, right? It's actually a bigger percent of travel volume goes into the Detroit area. And we need that to get back to normal because without that business travel, without the sports event travel coming back, uh, we're going to continue to have challenges. We need to get people back to our cities, especially since so many people are, are working from home. If we don't support those businesses, those restaurants, those attractions and such, yep, yep. they're not going to be around for us either. So we need to bring more travelers in to help support us. And then as we come back to the cities, we can bring those cities back to life. And then we're going to really notice a real rebound. And I think this coming year is going to be great, especially with this Keep It Fresh campaign. I can't wait. Yeah, and that's why if you're uh, making plans to travel to any of the uh, high trafficked areas of Michigan, you better start making those reservations right now. Right, Dave? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, don't forget about those lesser known places. Get oh, out yeah. there. We give you a lot of, a lot of ideas on Michigan.org. So get out there, have a great time and enjoy pure Michigan. I love it. Thanks so much for the conversation, Dave. Really good to talk to you again. Same here. Have Dave, a great day. You bet. You too. And that's going to wrap it up for Flashpoint. Thanks so much for being here. Meet the press coming up next week. Have a great week and we'll see you next time for Flashpoint.